The WRX GT has quite a bit to prove at $43,000. Thankfully, Subaru has made quite a few changes for the controversial top spec. But they've also made some head-scratching decisions that make for a sort of harsh conclusion. If you enjoy fun, detailed car content without fluff, consider subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications. I'm gonna try to be as objective and open-minded as I can be here, so please hear me out. First off, with this price, this sits exactly where the previous WRX STI sat. And for that money, there's not really a whole lot of exterior differences outside of these matte gray wheels, which pair up with the gray grille kind of nicely. But this isn't a full review, and I don't like to talk too much about aesthetics to begin with, so let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section. Personally, I think I would get this in black or gray, as it would blend in better with the body cladding that still hasn't grown on me. One thing that is exclusive to GT and limited buyers is steering responsive headlights. All though will get LEDs. But not all will be able to pick one of these up for MSRP, which is why I appreciate Royal on the East Side in Bloomington, Indiana, the friendly, knowledgeable dealer that let me test drive this WRX, and where you can pick up any new Subaru, VW, or Audi without paying over sticker. Under the hood, we'll have a 2.4 liter twin scroll turbocharged Boxer 4. It makes 271 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque, and it runs on a premium tune. And I had some people like say that they were putting regular in it and it rode just fine. These are designed to run on regular if they need to, but I personally wouldn't advise doing that on a regular basis. Your money though, your call. Now all cars except for the base there will have proximity key unlock and lock, and an exterior trunk release, along with a tiny spoiler. But all cars do get these neat taillights and quad exit exhaust. Anyway, this will either come hooked up to a six-speed manual, or in my case, a C... You can get a CVT... A CVT. Subaru has gone through great lengths to brand this as the Subaru Performance Transmission, to which I understand why, but I also could not care less. Let's see how it performs and try out a quick 0 to 60. AC off, traction control off, Sport Sharp, or Sport Plus up here. It feels like an Outback CVT at the low end, but picks up nicely. I was honestly expecting it to launch off harder. I think it realized what I was doing, and so it didn't do any fake shifting there. That's a good idea on Subaru's part. Zero to 60 in 5.9 seconds. Despite the aggressive 4.44 to 1 final drive ratio, and that ability to hold RPMs in the power band, the drivetrain loss and weak CVT launches will make this WRX GT much slower than the slightly more expensive Golf R Dual Clutch. That's because the R has proper launch control and can take off with supercar rivaling gusto. 315 horsepower doesn't hurt either. Although, with the extreme scarcity of Golf R's, the WR Rex has a leg up unless you have Catholic patience. But there are also many others to consider in this price bracket from Mazda to BMW. The biggest bonehead move that Subaru made for the GT trim was not offering it with the stick as it is the only trim with key performance-focused features. The manual Rex will also beat this to 60 if you're willing to smack it in the face with a 5,000 RPM takeoff. With a relatively gentle launch, I was still able to get 6.1 seconds from a three-pedal model, and that also costs a couple grand less than the auto. The advantage to the SPT that Subaru had has here is it mimics shifts, and it does a pretty good job of impersonating them because uh, it, one, it's designed to shift very fast. So they say that it is like 30% faster up shifts, 50% uh, faster down shifts. They said they were trying to benchmark the DSG and I guess it maybe in technical terms, it does shift as quick as them. But the thing that, you know, I'm sure Subaru knows is that this doesn't need to shift you're saying it has 50% quicker shift time, and that's great, but every time it shifts, it's making it slower. Because you're taking the car out of its peak horsepower, which is also why Subaru has tuned it to not fake shift if you nail the throttle from a standstill. It's quicker without the pseudo shifts. It's also why in comfort and normal mode, it won't fake shift under lighter acceleration. 
because it's more efficient without it. They're only doing it because the powertrain in its natural state behaves like an Outback, which would spit in a fanboy's breakfast. So this is the most effective way for Subaru to give you a transmission that feels like an eight-speed auto without them actually having to make one. Standard mode here. Yeah, I mean, it responds nicely. Definitely more eager than other Subarus I've tried out with this powertrain. The FA24 still has some lag to it, but it feels more lively when out of peak boost than the old engine. From a roll, this thing is actually pretty fun as it gets spooled up and pulls hard with the transmission stepping through its eight pre-selected ratios very quickly. It picks the right RPMs for most scenarios and avoids lugging the engine. It's tuned very well. At 60 miles per hour, it will hover at about 2,000 RPMs. This road noise was pronounced to an acceptable degree for 31 grand, but it's disappointing at this price. On the inside of the WRX GT, you do see some nicer appointments here to try to justify the cost of the top trim, like stitched suede here on the dashboard. And of course, these GT exclusive Recaro seats, they're ultra suede, they are eight-way power adjustable, but they don't have lumbar adjustment. I think I might prefer the ultra suede seats on the limited trim and because those do have lumbar adjustment and they still have a fair amount of bolstering. Yeah, these are a little bit better for like performance driving, but honestly, I'm not really too crazy about them. This also does have better rest points. I mean, one, especially for the center console here over the base I drove. But then you do actually have more padding for where your inboard knee will rest. So that makes for just a more plush experience overall. And I'm gonna try to stick to more of the highlights here. This isn't my full review. If you wanna see that, I'll link it below. When it comes to tech in the WRX, on every car except for the base, you'll have an 11.6 inch touchscreen with a few physical buttons on the side for your climate controlled to at least give you the ability to make some quick adjustments. The system itself feels dated, the resolution's okay, response time is okay. You won't have any sort of virtual gauge cluster, but there's an appeal to that in this sort of performance vehicle that's really marketed as a raw punch you in the mouth kind of car. But despite its hard personality, if you go with an automatic transmission, you'll have a electric parking brake versus the handbrake and the stick shifts. Your top two specs will have a Harman Kardon sound system with 11 speakers. It does have a subwoofer. It has enough power. It's not super crisp or anything, but if you're an audiophile, this is a definite improvement over the base setup. And the GT and the Limited will have a sunroof as standard, but honestly, when it comes to features, this is just disappointing for the price. It is performance focused. I'm not expecting this to be a luxury car, but when you're asking this much money and you're trying to poise this as more of a GT car, then things like a heads up display, wireless charger, ventilated seats, heated steering wheel, I would like to at least see those and none of them are offered. For me, if I'm looking at this or a couple grand more and I'm getting a Golf R, the last L of the interior is that it's not a hatchback, but the trunk is at least quite wide and the rear seats do fold, but it won't best a Jetta GLI, and like most others, this has no spare tire. Oddly enough, passenger space of the WRX back seat is smaller than that of the Impreza, a car that this only shares its platform with at this point. Yet at 6'3", I could scrape by if front seat me had a sliver of sympathy. USB ports will come on the premium spec and up, but no rear vents. So the interior is still not a big selling point to the WRX. But what about the handling of the GT? We do have adaptive suspension now. So the idea is that you can have the best of both worlds, a stiffer suspension and a softer suspension, than the sta standard car. Why is someone on a bird scooter on a 55 mile per hour? Corn makes corn. One thing I will say, I like the steering. That was one thing that they've tweaked here. So part of these like new five driving modes for the WRX GT is that uh, it will give you adaptive steering and it does make for a nicer steering experience. I think uh, it now feels a little bit more predictable and natural feeling than the standard WRX. It still does feel numb to me. I'm not getting a whole lot of communication, but I do think the waiting is a little nicer and the buildup is better. It's just still not as playful as something like the BRZ or GR86. It still seems shy of the engaging GTI. What the WRX does best is confidence, and that's abundant here. It's flat through the corners, maybe a little bit more so as you pick up speed than the standard WRX, uh, which also didn't really have any body roll issues. 
They all have a very low center of gravity from that boxer engine, so handling was a strong suit to begin with. When I drive it on a tighter, imperfect back road, this still has the you know, charismatic WRX nature, which is this tough car that's not really phased by anything. You know, you can take it around corners, imperfections, it doesn't care. And yeah, the suspension still feels as stout as ever. But in all drive settings, this still has the composure you would expect from the nameplate. And then if I put it into comfort mode, everything kind of dials down, including transmission response. It still does try to mimic an eight-speed automatic, but now I can kind of notice more of its CVT characteristics at times. I thought that the base WRX I drove not too long ago had a great balance between comfort and sport. And I don't think it's really gets that much firmer and sport sharp but it is more comfortable. It takes on a, dare I say, supple attribute when in comfort mode. Now we're really on to comfortable daily levels here. And the steering honestly still feels quick, and that's another advantage to it, especially when we get onto tighter corners. This just feels so capable, and I was driving it in pouring rain earlier, and the all-wheel drive system in here didn't let, I mean, it, it almost let too little of drama. This actually does have a 45-55 torque split until it decides that it needs to send more power either way. You barely even know of its slight rear bias there because it stays glued. The brakes also bring the car to a halt quickly and are easy to modulate, but the GT does not see a size increase over the others. I'd like to mention that another pro to the last gen WRX was its overall reliability with its biggest issues deriving from the clutch and AC early on. I hope this gen proves itself and the 2.4 turbo and high torque linear Tronic CVT have been good so far outside of a recall in 2020 that was caused by a powertrain computer. Now another advantage to the CVT models is that you will have eyesight, which is something that I know a lot of WRX buyers don't care about, but this is also supposed to be a family vehicle and you know, having at least the availability of autonomous braking, adaptive cruise control, lane centering and departure prevention is something I could see as valuable and this car is gonna have that standard. The GT and Limited also get blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert. The enhancements for the WRX GT allow you to tune the car to your preference and to a more noticeable degree than I was expecting. It allows the car to be a little more comfortable and just as competent, if not a tad more, on a back road. But more than just capability, you want fun. And with the steering just not being super raw and communicative, you have the transmission to rely on in the other WRX that I drove. You know, it's a fun, notchy gearbox. It feels like a little rally car. You can see that they're trying to emulate that here, giving you paddle shifters and... It just doesn't do the same thing. And when you have it in Sport Sharp, yeah, it does kind of buck a little bit when you shift, but it's just like eight tenths, nine tenths the way to the visceral feeling that you get with a dual clutch out of a VW GTI. I guess it, it's sounding like I'm just complaining about this. And truly, I think if you get out and actually drive one, you will be way more impressed with this one than the previous car. Let it do its thing and you don't think about it. This is a decent setup. Feels like a standard automatic. Most of the time, I wouldn't be able to know the difference. Which is why I now understand their desire to rebrand it as the SPT. Outside of its embarrassing launching abilities, I'm surprised to say it feels better for back road blasts than Mazda's six speed auto in the Mazda 3 Turbo. Sports sedans like the WRX are not big money makers. Hyundai and VW Group didn't build their DCTs because their sport compacts needed a good automatic. They use it across their lineup. Honda and Toyota don't even offer an auto in the GR Corolla, Civic Si, or Type R because it would probably cost them too much to do it right. And since I'm assuming that Subi couldn't unga boonga the six-speed auto from the BRZ to work here, it makes sense that they would do this. If you're sold on the all-weather, all-road conquering WRX, but are unable to buy a manual for whatever reason, this is much better than it was before. The Subaru Performance Transmission provides a natural, linear feeling better than any CVT I have ever driven. Still, the key aspect to the sales pitch of the WRX Automatic is that you don't want to stick, and you've already convinced yourself that you want a WRX. This could be because you don't trust VW, or you like the personality, or you really prioritize all-wheel drive. But what bothers me is how poorly this compares to other automatic sports sedans and the price you pay for it. 
both initially and at the pump. 21 combined on premium is hilarious for a CVT. Here's a seemingly incoherent analogy to wrap this up. Last year I went to a super fancy steakhouse with an old friend and got a ribeye steak with hollandaise sauce on it that was fantastic. However, if a good chef got a hold of a Walmart piece of sirloin, cooked, seasoned, and dressed it well with the right sauce, they could call it whatever they wanted and I'd have been satisfied enough. But the experience wouldn't have been as phenomenal and I'd still be out $75. You can tune and tweak a transmission to the best of your abilities, even yielding an impressive result while you're at it, but you're still competing against a dual clutch with a CVT. There's a reason why no other sports car even attempts that. This setup will substitute just fine, but it's still a couple steps behind authenticity and a name change can't fix that. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like to help me commandeer the YouTube algorithm. If you want to see more, subscribe and hit the bell. And thank you to my very loyal patrons. I'll catch you in the next one.